Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Eric, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you are already a subscriber, thank you so much for your ongoing support, because subscribers not only receive new content directly to their inboxes as soon as it publishes, but also are able to interact with every contributor directly, including me, which, hey. So if you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other articles, podcasts, and videos by our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find in the show notes. Well, today, I am just beyond ecstatic to be speaking with a good friend of mine, Caden Netopak. Hi, Caden. Hello, hello, Amethyst. We've got the co- we got the cool hair club going on today, don't we? We really <laughs> do, yes. And there is just like this veritable laundry list. There's a cornucopia of... Let me just go through the introduction. Because, let's see, we've got... Um, so. Caden is an award-winning queer transgender producer, author, podcaster, activist. There are awards and accolades coming out your ears. Let me just run through a couple. So Late to the Game was a podcast, yes? No, it was actually a video series, web series. Okay, video series. Mm. Okay. Earned you an Academy, International Academy of <laughs> International Academy of Web Television's Best Host Award. That's something. Um, we got Best Television Pilot Finalist at Cannes, Best Script Winner at the London International Festival of World Cinema, as well as the Fantasy Sci-Fi Film and Screenplay Competition, Best One Hour Drama Finalist for New York Screenplay Competition. Like, do you want me to keep going? I mean, you can if you want. And make, <laughs> making me making my day over here. <laughs> right? But <laughs> nobody ever reads my bio. This, I'm looking for work right now, so this helps, you know. <laughs> Nobody's reading my bio. They're looking at my resume and they're like, what do you do? And I'm like, okay, and just go just go read my bio. <laughs> but now, now we're looking at social media content for yeah. the transgender community. And this is, you know, where you and I have really con- uh, connected yeah. because you're documenting your transition. Um, so you're on both TikTok, I know, and Instagram. Yes. And it's um, it's called Diary of a Trans Fairy Prince. And we'll we'll get links into the show notes, believe me. But um, and most recently, I completely forgot. You produced the California Aggregation for Gender, Gender Diversity Fundraiser. And I was a part of it, which yes, you know, thank so you. And you're the you're beautiful. one of the best parts. Can I say that it was it was so much fun having you on live. I mean, yeah, but you know, no. Not really true. <laughs> thank you. I do we, appreciate it. We, we compliment so. each other here. That's what we're doing. We're complimenting each other. <laughs> That's right. What am I doing? Red. I, I should have let you go with it, but yeah. Um, <laughs> so I want to go. So you did transition gender, and I want to to go like way back because i always try to do this yes you have done acting creating producing how did all of this just to start from the beginning how did this how did all of this really inform how you ended up exploring yourself like how did this turn into mm. who you are today Ooh, that's I, that's a good question and if i were to go back back uh first of all i think I want to talk about just being out there, right? Because I feel like as a child, I grew up in a really small town. I had big ambitions. You know, I grew up in the 80s. Everything seemed like fabulous out there in the world. And here I am in this tiny little town feeling a little stuck. And so I initially dove into um, acting was first I was a dancer and, um, and I was a dancer and I would put on these like performances for my community. Um, I, when I was 10 years old, I wrote, I took like this book about rabbits and I adapted it into a play and I like cast my friends and I, and I asked the teachers if I could perform this play in the classroom. Like it wasn't like a huge production, but it was like a bunch of us. Like I wrote the script and everything because one, I always felt like I was hidden in the small town and I wanted to be seen, you know, and I have a family life where like, I didn't really feel seen by my family as well. There's some MIA parentage there. And I really felt like I just had these big dreams. Like I knew as a child that I was meant for something bigger than this tiny little town. I felt very suffocating. In fact, I think in one of my classes in high school, I was voted best, like most likely to get the hell out of town. Like that, that kind of thing for my teachers, they were just like, yeah, you don't belong here. Like what I, like you don't belong here. 
And secondly, I always, I was the person that was always forming the groups and trying to make the community thing. So community was such a big thing for me. Like it wasn't just about me. I put, I produced that production. I wrote it, but then I put my friends in it and I let them star in the production. Like I never really wanted to be the star per se. I always wanted to create something that we could all be a part of. That was like our self-expression. So early on in life, I felt like I was very clear with like who I was. I was a tomboy. I'm going to use that term because back in the day, that's what we called masculine girls that played with the boys and thought they were boys. And this was well prior to puberty. Like I thought I was a boy. So I was doing all these things in a way that felt right to me. And I felt like I, I, my parents were very open. And so they allowed me to express, I mean, there's a little MIA parentage, like I said, there on my dad's side. So I didn't really get a lot of pushback. It was like, it, that was back in the day when they said, they opened the door and said, go play, come back at six. Like they didn't, parents did not care. Right. This generation, Gen Z, right? Yeah. Parents did not care where you were. So there was no right. control over what I did. I felt like I was very creative as a child, but then I got older. I um, graduated um, college. I went into the workforce. I started acting. Uh, I was working in tech. Like I was kind of doing a bunch of different things. I was an artist. And especially in the world of Hollywood, I very much ran into the buckets. Okay, now you, sure. you what are you? Who are you? What niche can you play? Are you the quirky girl? Are you the sexy girl? You know, I hear I have like this long red hair and, you know, a a, a higher voice um, before taking testosterone. And I was curvy and I had these giant breasts, unfortunately, that blossomed at the age of 15. So I got stuck into the the uh, Jessica Rabbit sexy girl category, even though I was very fun, outgoing person. And I was very masculine and athletic because of my body, literally because of my breasts, I would cut in my curves. I would constantly get these roles that were super feminine and sexy and, and I'm a queer person too. So it was always like being sexy with a guy. I think I booked a role for Oregon lottery, um, in my twenties where, they like coupled everybody off and it was a print ad and it was like, Oh, there's like super generic. Oh, there's the white couple. There's the black couple. There's the Asian couple. And I was like, who's my partner. And it was like a guy who was like 30 years older than me. And I was the trophy wife. So I kept getting put into these roles and, you know, fast forward, I started making my own content because I was like, this is not me. And I went ahead and I started like practicing swords and I was making fantasy content that I could be a part of because that was me. But having said all of that, I think early on in my life, I knew who I was. Like I was very masculine, regardless of how I looked. I also grew up in the eighties. So I, masculinity to me was like having long hair and wearing guy liner. Right. I was super masculine, right? I was, I was, I was going to concerts with men who looked far more fabulous than me and that was okay. So I saw myself right. in these people. But once I got out into the world, I feel like all of that was crushed. I was constantly put into a bucket. I was constantly, you know, believed that I was heterosexual, even though I'm queer. Men started harassing me and sexually harassing me and um, objectifying my body, especially because I was an actor and a host in Hollywood. And I really got pushed to be more feminine as, as I got older, it was like in my 20s and 30s, especially, it was like, you need to be more feminine. You're not feminine enough. If, if you're going to get work, you need to fit this stereotype that we sure. are creating for you. And I would say in 2019, I, I, I left Hollywood. I said, I can't do this anymore. I, I want to do my own shows. I don't want to do this. I want to do something else. And I left to write a book series. But when I left, I had to do a lot of deep healing with the pandemic, We were all kind of shoved to do the internal work, even though I had done a lot of the childhood stuff. This particular um, healing was around gender and self-identity and how I felt that was taken away from me for years. And I dove in and, and that during that era is when I really went back to like, but who am I? I don't want to be this feminine person. I'm not this right. feminine person. Yes, I still love my hair, but like I don't like wearing dresses. I never did like wearing dresses. I did on red carpets because I had to. And you see in Elliot Page's memoir and his stories, he had the moment where that was the light bulb moment. And the light bulb moment for me was in the middle of the pandemic. A friend had a wedding and they, and you know, weddings are super gendered. 
And I was going to be in the wedding party and they said, you need to pick out a dress, a bridesmaid's dress. And I, and I got these dresses and I tried them on. They all emphasized my boobs. I mean, like the padding, sure. everything was just like, oh, these D cups are even bigger. And I freaking broke down. I broke down and I had a panic attack and I said, I can't do this. And then over the next few months, like I came out as transgender, but then I also, for everybody listening, um, my friend was so sweet and she said, you know, you can go ahead and wear a suit if you want to, but I didn't even want to wear a suit. I was like, but I'm somewhere in between. Like, I don't, I don't want to do that. And I don't want to do that. Where do I belong? And that's really when I started looking into the diversity that is gender, the diversity that is me. And I realized like, you know, I'm kind of like in between here. I'm I I have my own personal expression and there are certain parts of society when you're an actor, now it's a little bit different going to weddings. You know, we were talking about paganism a minute ago. Everything is so binary gendered that I felt like I just didn't belong anywhere. But once I started exploring and then that led to my exploration I realized like, wow, maybe I'm just my own thing and I just don't fit. Maybe they're wrong and I'm not wrong. Right. And I think that's right. where a lot of people get to is like, we talk about, we're going to talk about that being a mix is I had to realize I am not wrong here. I am not the misfit yeah. here. I am not out of place. Society has pushed these things for specific reasons, mostly to oppress women and feminine and femininity. And I am not wrong. It's okay to be me. So that. That's just my life history right there. <laughs> Are we done? Is that, that I'm just <laughs> right. Can I just hit stop? <laughs> you know, though, I, I will tell you because I never it never struck me like if you're going for roles, I've got to try to pull I try to pull this thought together that yeah. if you're going for roles, it's because you're supposed to fill a role and those roles yeah. are always yeah. fairly rigid, very strict. And it never struck me how I mean, even dangerous, I think that would be that you go, well, I always have to play the ingenue. Yeah, I always have to, you know, yeah. I'm, a, I'm either always Juliet or I'm always the nurse, you know? Yeah. And, and, and for me, you know, weird. someone that had been sexually harassed and abused, oh. um, my whole, you know, just not my parents, not my family, thank God, but good, I had like good, male good. neighbors that had tried yeah. to sexually abuse me when I was little. Um, I mean, just growing up in the world full of cis men. I mean, I was very, I look like Jessica Rabbit. I was highly sexualized and abused. Sure. And for me to then go and be cast in those roles where I had to be sexy for men and I'm a queer person here, it was, it was, it was too much. It was too much. Right. And, right. Um, you know, and I, I think there's a lot of, I've had conversations from a lot of trans mask people who were more butch and more masculine and they did not have those experiences. And I was like, well, this so much plays into like yeah. why I could not fit into these gender roles because they are right. to oppress femininity. They are to oppress women. They are to sexualize women. That's why we have them in the first place. That's why marriage exists to create property. Women were property. That's the only reason sure. why marriage exists as it does sure. today is to own your partner. So, so having gone through this trauma, it was even more traumatic to, to have to like be cast in these roles. Like, Oh, you like, I can't just be like the quirky, funny person I am. I have to be like now this like vixen, which, which God, it was so upsetting. And I, and I had to quit. I was like, I can't do this anymore. I believe it. Yeah. Now that you've transitioned, would you want to go back or are there still scars? You know, I will say, um, so I am in the process of transitioning. I haven't fully transitioned, you know, a year and a half on testosterone. I'm hoping that my voice keeps dropping. And I, I do, I am really wanting to have like the masculine body and the voice and the hair and all that. Sure. But having said that, um, I, I dream about like being in a romance cover or, you know, being seen as like, like I go by trans fairy prince because we know the other yeah. world and, and the other spirits, like they don't have this gender shit. Right. Can I swear? Can I swear on here? Right. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. fucking lutely. It's a but, um, I will say it's been a challenge because I have tried to go back, not into acting. I'm not an actor. Oh. I turned into a host. Uh, so I've been doing that for a lot longer. Yeah. But 
now people are looking for very stereotypical queer identities. You'll see in the queer spaces that if they're looking for trans guys, they want binary trans guys. They want like, yeah. oh, we need to show this sexy guy who's like been on testosterone for 20 years and is super ripped and has short hair. And so, right. um, or they're looking for like, like there's these stereotypes I can, you can see in a lot of queer advertising, even like spaces that are queer, mm -hmm. you'll see in the pictures, yes. everybody has to look funky and fun. Like there's a certain look to queer that they put out there. Whereas I feel like, okay, well, I'm a nature person. I'm an outdoor person. Like I still have long hair. Where do I even fit? And so it's been a challenge because I don't feel like, I, I don't feel like a stereotype at all. And therefore I don't feel like I fit a lot of these castings yeah. and yeah. on top of that, you know, like I said, everything is just, I totally spaced on what I was gonna say, but everything is, is very, it's still very binary, even within the queer and mm -hmm. trans spaces. And so we yeah. haven't moved or if it's, if it's gender non-conforming, it's like so androgynous that it's, a, it makes it a point, but usually you will notice that it's still on the masculine side. Like I'm a masculine person in my heart, but I don't look super mask, but you'll notice sure. that if they're going to put a non-binary person in, they're going to have short hair. They're going to, you know, they're not going to have long mm -hmm. hair. They're not going to look overly feminine because masculinity is still the desired look. Um, yes. Unless they're specifically like, okay, you probably get this all the time. You're a trans woman. Well, you got to be feminine then. Cause you know, now we're showcasing trans women. You got to look like, you know, right. there's so right. much that, that you probably experience in that as well. So, oh, oh, and here's what I was going to say. Um, I did try to go back even as a speaker, as a speaker, like I'm not cast in a role here. I'm, I'm me, I'm speaking and being a trans person. What I get a lot of times is like, oh, you're just so niche, you know, well, you don't have a big enough following for us to like want to work with you, but you're very niche. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and you know, we, we already did the pride thing in June. So like, you know, so I, I, sure. I hired a manager and I tried to get speaking gigs and she could not get anything. Meanwhile, when I was presenting yeah. as a female, I worked all the time because right. I fit a stereotype. Yeah. And I was a powerful woman in business and now I'm a powerful trans person in business and they don't care. It's like, oh, but we're not, we're not promoting you right now because a lot of those people are like, oh, we don't, we don't, we feel so uncomfortable around trans people mm -hmm. that we don't want to, right. we don't want to have the conversation. We don't put ourselves on the spot. So we're just not going to bring that person in. So it's been a challenge. Right. It's, I actually, the, everything you've said there, I had a conversation, I don't know, maybe a month ago with a friend of mine named Danny. I'll bring up Danny Velasquez Mora again. If you're out there, Danny, hi. Hi, Danny. <laughs> um, she runs she runs a company. She founded a company that um, tries to get tries to get better representation. First of all, in particular for women. But we had a conversation where she said, "How would you do marketing for a transgender woman?" And I, you know, so it was funny because she would ask me these questions as a transgender woman. This as a transgender woman. This, and I would say, well, here are the challenges that I've faced probably exactly what you have. And she would go, yeah, that was exactly. As and a I, woman. Yeah. So we got to the end and it was like, the thing is that it's not that I want transgender, like obvious transgender representation, like what you're talking about. Yeah. When they try to make it obvious, it's always, you get somebody who's, who's not a completely passing transgender woman or, you know, you have a slightly feminine looking transgender man, or you have somebody non-binary who's leaning toward. The, and it's like, we see what you're doing. Like, it's obvious what you're trying to do is say, we're, we're, we're representing here. We're going to put in some representation so that you trans people are going to feel good about yourself. And at the end of it, it's like, but I'm, but I'm me. Yeah. Like, I'm not any of these people. I'm me. And I'd really rather you market to, me just like, Hey, we have bitch and clothes. And I go, okay, these are bitch and clothes. Clearly I grew up <laughs> in the eighties. We're going to, we going to pull out some right? technology here. We're going to go psych. <laughs> it was fully radical and bitch and stuff that I was seeing. Um, somebody just watched this and was like, what did Caden just do? What, did, what was what, what is the psych? Go Google it. Go Google it. Right. Right. No, no, no. I got it. Cause you yeah. Well, initially it'd be the shake the hand. Yes. <laughs> so you, like, such a dis, such a dis back in my day. <laughs> right. And you think about it today and it's kind of like, 
that was kind of stupid. P- Nowadays, people are like, actually, I don't want to touch you. So that, that we don't we don't need to shake hands. We don't want to. Right, exactly. Group. We don't want to touch. And you can't do this. You yeah. can't go, hey, ooh, say. Yeah. <laughs> Just pretend I dissed you, okay? And you're like, yeah, you look like an idiot. That, at that point, somebody's well, looking though? at you like, you are insane. I'm walking away. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. I don't want this role anyway. I'm out of here. So, yeah. Um, You had brought up, you had brought up, so trans fairy prince. So typically somebody, you, you throw fairy into something, and it's probably different for me, yeah. but typically you throw fairy into something and you think of the Victorian era, Tinkerbell floating around, you know, little wings and, and pixie dust. But you spell it with the the old English yeah. spelling. So so how about if I just stop right there and just say, tell me, how does the fairy fit into, how does the fairy prince fit into Caden? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, like I kind of said a minute ago, I feel like a lot of the queer, especially the queer culture is very much like, it, to me, it always feels like pride parades where everybody's glamorous. Like it really is very much based around being glamorous and city life and clubs right. and all that, you know, but I'm, a, I'm a nature person. I'm an outdoor person. I, um, I'm a spiritual person, not pagan. I'm sorry. I'm a spiritual person, not religious, not Wiccan. I, I am a witch and I'm a pagan, but I'm a solitary person. So I've spent decades, you know, practicing my craft, my magic has to do with being part of nature and, and my connection to animals and nature and the land. And, you know, so when I came out, I, I had a very specific vision of myself, like kind of what I look like right now. I looked a lot more girly back then when I started and I came out and I thought, no, like I was looking at trans guys and trans men and trans masks. And I said, I just don't fit into that. I don't, I don't want to look like an alpha male. I don't want to cut my hair. I don't want to start wearing big baggy clothes. Like I hate men's clothes. It's t- there. It's yeah. so, especially in America, very unimaginative, unless you're like, you know, there's a lot more funky options, but for the most part, men's clothes to me are pretty boring. Unless you're, unless you're historical male clothing, men, it's gorgeous, but I digress. And I felt like, how do I get across who I am? And I thought, oh. well, fairy princes, you know, fairy princes. Yes. Like I, I go to festivals all the time. I'm, I'm going to Beltane in a few days to celebrate with my pagan friends. And these spaces are where men still have long hair. Men are, they're musicians, they're creators. They're, yeah. you know, they, they, they're rugged. They've got rugged in a different kind of way, long hair, beards. Nobody cares about being glamorous. You know, half the time we're naked. And I thought, yeah, this is, this is what I, I might be. I might be. In a few days, I'm not, I'm not gonna put that out there. Good. No, good. good. <laughs> was, uh, pictures, pictures, anybody? No. Sacred spaces. <laughs> But I felt like I was laying there one day and I said, I really want to change my, my handle. I don't want my name on here. And sure. how do I emphasize like who, who I am? And fairy prince was the first thing that came to mind. And I thought, yeah, because when you think of fairy prince, not like when you think of fairies, you think of Tinkerbell. When you think of fairy princes, you think of yes. people who look like me. You know, it's like the guy with the long flowing hair and, mm-hmm. and, the, and, and, you know, and the elf ears that I've, I've right. mentally got the, the elf cheek ears. Bones. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I felt like this is, this is what I look like. If I looked up fairy prints, I would find pictures of people who look like me and they would be, right. you know, probably mostly cis men. And so that's kind of how the name came about and it stuck and, and people, you know, people really looked at it and said, oh, I get it. I get like, not everybody. Some people were like, saw the the word prince and they were like, how dare you say you're royalty? And I was like, no, this is not about human royalty. I'm talking about the other world here. I'm talking about prince. Yeah. yeah. And again, you know, when you're working with working with actual fairies and energies and land spirits, there is no gender here. They don't care about that. You are a soul having a human experience. And I would say, the most positive parts about paganism, um, and I would say more old paganism, not modern day, which we'll probably talk about, is that it's all about incorporating the masculine and feminine within yourself. And that's yeah. what I fit. When I look at a fairy prince, I see like, I'm going to use the words, but I'll see like a more feminine man who doesn't care that he's wearing long gowns and looks pretty, but also has like this amazing masculinity to him. And I, I, I thought like that was me. Yeah. I 
I hear that. I think of Fairy Prince and I think of, yeah, what you're saying. It's like the flowing hair. You've got somebody with a long sword and you know when that person, you know when that person's going to draw the sword, like death is going to happen because you're like, hey, I'm a super great sword person. And it's like, no, sorry, I was right behind you. And, you know, that it's the end of the sword duel. It's not even a duel, you know, <laughs> so. So I get that. Yes, I for what it's worth, I didn't. I didn't put it all together. So thank you. I'm so you're welcome. And, and, and glad that you explained that. But. This beautiful fairy deck I have, or it's it's more of a pagan deck, and I love it. It's called the Hidden Realm. And there is a mm. King of Cups figure. And if anyone who practices tarot, which you know, I think we both do, we yes. uh, the King of Cups in this particular deck, and in most decks, is that fairy prince. It's the it's the masculine individual that is not afraid to be emotional and, and feminine. Yeah. And it's this beautiful combination. And the thing about this deck, this particular card is like the king of cups knows when to rule with empathy and compassion, but also yes. knows when to pull their sword when absolutely necessary, because that's a toxic right. masculine trait, if not used at the right time, at the right moment for the right reason. And, and again, this all comes into this beautiful mix of like, you know, we're going to flow as much as we can. We're actually, most of the world, I think, really should sit in their femininity as much as they can. And then when we need to do something, we pull in the more positive masculine traits. But we live in a world where masculinity rules and it's toxic. So, you know, I had to go to a yes. literally other realm to explain myself. <laughs> I'm not a human here, people. I'm going to another realm. <laughs> Which, what of course, you know, point. the folks are like... That's a mental illness. And I was like, you just need to get a check on your own spirituality, people. <laughs> kind of. I ha I have an off the wall question because yeah. you said you've been practicing now for on the order of a decade or, or, or longer, I maybe. Sorry. But um, especially since you're solitary, I'm going to love asking this. So. Gosh, it's going even better because on your chest right now is a triple moon. Yes. So your your relationship with the moon, did it change at all during when you started uh, testosterone therapy? Absolutely. I love this question. Um, and first of all, the, uh, I do follow my matron goddess is the Morgan. And so I got this in Glastonbury with one of my best friends who has the same necklace. And Damn, it was really? a very, very big, it's got amethyst in it and it's a very, it, I never take it off. It's, it's my most sacred symbol. Um, and when I look at the triple goddess, I'll answer that question in a second, but when I look at the mm -hmm. triple oh, goddess and I look at Hecate and uh, the Morrigan and all of these in, in other cultures, those are only just Celtic cultures. I, well, I guess he Hecate is more Greek, right? Greek. Yeah. She's, she yes. goes way back. These are goddesses who have a lot of masculine energy that blend into the world. I would not call them women. Sure. I would not call them man. So, so when I look at the triple goddess, it does represent, you know, mother maiden crone, which I actually have a ring here that says, I love this. It says dance like the maiden, love like the mother, think like the crone. And so oh. I'm all about the threes and, and the, and the, and the duality. And the, I guess to say the, the triple, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the three tri sides triality? of us. Yeah, yeah. The three sides of us. So that really plays into it. Um, but, um, oh my gosh, what was your question? <laughs> oh, the moon. Oh, the, moon. the relationship to the moon. Yeah. <laughs> now, speaking of the moon, I, I have to admit, I have never really felt, felt a solid affinity with the moon. I've always been a sun person. I think I've had past mm. lives as a sun worshiper. I'm a sun okay. person. I have to be, I'm depressed when it's dark out, um, especially in the winter. It's a really difficult time. I am all about the energy of the sun. And so right. I've never really had like a big affinity to the moon, which most witches do, especially more female, which is they're always like, Oh, the moon, this and the moon that. And I'm like, okay, but what about the sun? Sure. So, so when I started, you know, and obviously I, born female, I went through my cycle, the monthly cycle and, and all of that. So I still keep track. But when I started testosterone, like that went away and or recently went away, I should say when I upped my dose and I found myself on that daily cycle that of like the sun, you know, and I, I'm, I'm sure. somebody that goes with the weather. I go with the patterns of nature. I go with the seasons. I, I, I definitely try to map my body and rhythms to what's happening outside. 
but this is a thing we see every day. So it, it did kind of allow me to dive deeper into like sun worship and sun work. And like, I do all my rituals in the morning during the day, as opposed to at night. Whereas previously I had waited yeah. till like nighttime till the moon was out. I'd, I'd be like, Oh, there's a full moon. I'm going to do this ritual. And I do that a lot less. Now I have like a daily routine where it's like, Oh, I wake up every day and this is my ritual. This is my magic now is like getting the energy into me, getting that sun energy into me to go out to the world and, and shine. So it did, it did change, but at the same time, I felt like I was, I felt like I kind of always knew I was a sun person. In fact, whoever believes in star seeds, I remember having a conversation where it was like, oh, the serious B or whatever. It was like, oh, these people are mostly sun signs. They're, they're, they're sun uh, energies and like sure. these ones over here, moon energies. And I was like, oh yeah, that makes so much sense. <laughs> Everything kind of pointed back to like, I am the sun person. I mean, I, I love all the planets. I'm, I love astrology too. So I love all the planets and all the moons True. of all the planets. <laughs> so, so I didn't know you had told me, you had told me, you know, your patron goddess, but for what it's worth, I didn't, we hadn't talked about the triple goddess in particular, yeah. because to me, for what it's worth, the, the triple goddess actually really, really integrates both masculine and feminine because you've got the generative, but but the the mother is both receptive and creative. Mm -hmm. But then you've got the crone who who uh, you know is very thoughtful and actually can be very directing. And you've got the maiden who who can be innocent and and uh, yeah. you know wondering and curious. I think it's the one of the greatest. I don't want to use the word embodiment because I guess it's a triple goddess, but it's it's a great you know representation i think of of the the mixture of that that all of us get yeah. we we aren't just the crone we're not just the maiden we can't just be any of these because we have yes. these ultimately cycles so i saw something posted Beautiful. the other day too which i thought was brilliant um and in most of the times with the triple goddesses too they will get different personalities like the morgan is three different goddesses in one right so it's like this, sure. this and that and they do exemplify those traits. And I saw something posted the other day. I'm going to try to remember what it said. Cause it was brilliant. It said, we're always, we're, we're always in a turmoil because our child self wants love and attention. Our, our middle-aged self, you know, our adult self wants justice and social justice and wants everything to be fair. So we're always trying to go out there and get stuff done. And our older selves just want peace and rest. And I find that those three things, it's like, if we look at the triple goddess, we look at the mother maiden crone, it really is incorporating all those different sides of ourself. Our yes. child self is always coming forward to want play and joy. And that's when I think of the maiden. It's like this innocent, it's not so much an innocent child as much as a child that is innocent of you know, all the traumas for the most part and, and, yes. and is able right. to play and is able to be childlike, unless of course they were traumatized sadly as children. Um, then you have the mother who, who is more knowledgeable, has had more experiences is in that, that prime of their life where they're able to go out and put everything that they are out into the world. And then once you get to the crone status, you're more of a reflector looking back, sharing your wisdom, look at all these beautiful right. things I've done. And all of that is the process of life. It's the process of living. So like, this is right. the process that we all go through. I don't even see it as masculine and feminine as much as like, it's a pro it's literally just, the just cycle of cycle. life. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I actually kind of like this. Now you've turned that into now a daily cycle yeah. as opposed to, as opposed to my, cause I, you know, the reason I asked is because it used to be the full moon would just was was it was the wrong time for me very very bad time for me i generally had you know breakdowns right around yeah. the the full moon i had a couple several mm -hmm. many and i found interestingly once i started on estrogen like the dark moon now is a difficult period for me the full moon comes around and i've got tons of energy and i'm like i'm gonna do everything in the world and the dark moon comes and i'm like Oh, fuck it all. I'm going to go spend a weekend in bed, you know, kind of thing. Wow. You know, what's interesting. That was actually my exact experience is that, is that wow. I would always, I, the full moon gave me so much energy. Like before I was on testosterone and the, the dark moon was the, tr the troublesome time. So that's sure. Fascinating that, you know, hormones, hormones, people, yes. like they're yes. not magical. 
it is so weird, but it's it switched for you. This made me feel like I was yeah. Oh, you got yeah, my digits. Hey. Call me, but <laughs> hey, everybody that had flip Psych. phones back in the day. <laughs> Wait, hold, hold my phone. <laughs> no, it's more, it more like this. Hold my phone. <laughs> It was this big. <laughs> oh man! So, but it's for you. The, the, the full the ourselves. full moon and the the dark moon switch for you. We're twenty here. Well, yes, I'm twenty twenty years older than everybody in yeah. the audience. <laughs> but but, but, but it, you're saying it did switch the the full moon. The effect of the full moon and the dark moon have now switched. Well, in your for, life? Yeah, for me, no, previously, the full moon was where I just felt the most powerful. And the, and the new moon yeah. was where I just felt like, oh, God, the life is getting sucked out of me. That's when I had all the challenges. But now yes. I feel like I've, I've, I've lost track of the moon a little bit, I will say. Um, I mm. have definitely lost track of the moon. I find that I am not thinking about it as much. Maybe I need to get back into it. That's something that I am working on is I feel like I kind of went so far into like having to prove my masculinity that I, I let sure. go of a lot of things. And now I'm like, you know what, actually I need to kind of come circle around back to that. So I haven't really noticed much, but I definitely say that yeah. I've forgotten about the moon. Okay. Sorry, moon. <laughs> Maybe that's why the moon's rain, raining chaos. No, I think, I think it's like Pluto, Pluto right now and Saturn are raining chaos. It's it, the moon is never an issue. And if you are having issues during certain moon cycles, it could because it could be because astrologically there are certain planets that are hitting that moon for you. Like the Scorpio sure. moon is like crazy beans for me. Whereas, you know, there's other moons where I'm like, oh, this is so great because it's actually helping me. Sure. If but I've got I don't even know how far back my journals go. I mean, I, I don't have them anymore, but I had journals that went back to two thousand five. The, the first time I went to the hut, to the psych ward. So, um, but I would start cause you know, it date them, date and time yeah. them. And at some point I know I read something. Somebody said, well, check moon phases. And I went, well, that's kind of weird. So, cause I always read a table of contents because yeah. I always thought, well, what if I need to refer back to something and I don't, but I still write contents. Because it forces you to kind of reread them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you go, oh, shit, that was really messed up a month ago. Got to keep glad I'm done with that. But I started putting like, you know, a close an open, you know, like an open circle or like a disc when things would happen. And I noticed the pattern mm, and it's not yeah. a pattern. You know, it's not like a a couple of times. I mean, it was the kind of thing like really consistently across yeah, years. I yeah. was like, wow, the moon really affects me. And I was so surprised. And how much it did, I guess. So same with the sun, though. I mean, we lived in upstate New York for a while. And when you don't see the sun for like a month at a time. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. oh God. The Pacific Northwest here is the worst. It's in the winter. Mm. It's just dark and yeah. rainy and, and it gets darker quicker. Right. And, you know, you're you wake up and it's dark and you come back from work and it's dark. And it's it's really a lot of people experience sad here. You know, I had to get a yeah, I had to get a, a light, just the light. Yeah, <laughs> yeah to yeah. help. And I mean, it kind of helps a little bit, but it's not the same. And I was living in California for years where I just had this right. fun every day. And I and I, I did feel a lot more energy there. Like, again, we, we talked about where we live and this place I live now. And I'm thinking, like, I don't know if this is for me. You know, maybe, maybe during the summer, but the rest of it is just not conducive to my energy. <laughs> yeah. The, that's actually a good lead in. Cause we've been talking about sun, moon, all that. We, we spoke earlier. Yeah. We did. Cause this is what you do, right? You, you get somebody on a podcast, you go, let's talk about the most interesting stuff. All right. Now let's hit record. Yeah, always, always. Um, <laughs> We're going to, we're going to keep it interesting. We are interesting people. Well, are you kidding me? Yeah. This, we're going to bring the interesting back just like, uh, whatever else we bring back. I don't even know. <laughs> 80s, you maybe. know what we should, <laughs> <laughs> right. What we should bring back is the word radical bitchin'. or right. are we going to get rad? I don't know. <laughs> what are the other words? Oh my gosh. There's so many, Do, you know, just one, only once in graduate school and it was 1990. Four that I went there, it just fell out of my mouth. Somebody, somebody did something. I went, that is fucking rad. And for the rest of the time, it fell out of my mouth. And I thought, 
I hope nobody heard that. For the rest of the time I was in graduate school, people would go, yeah, what'd you think of that? Fucking rad. And I'm like, all right, I'm from the from California. I get it. Yeah. Well, that, that and um, I, I still love the word awesome. I use the word awesome for everything. And I, I'm like, right. okay, I might not say totally awesome, okay, but I'm going <laughs> to use the word awesome. And I use the word like. A lot. So just Mm -hmm. get used to it. And people are like, what? Like, I always think like, wow, did I just date myself when I posted on that that 20-year-old person? And I say, so awesome. And I'm like, do they even know what that word means? That's a good good question. I can't even imagine not. I don't know. But pagan practice, I mean, we've, we've spoken, the two of you, the two of us have spoken actually rather voluminously about needing to integrate the masculine and the feminine. And and I at the even like I would think an, an earth centered religion or whatever spiritual practice let's use that mm-hmm. I would think that an earth centered practice would would have to focus on the idea that if you don't have the god and the goddess mm-hmm. if you don't have the seed and the earth you're not going to get corn and you're going to die and I would think that this was an obvious kind of thing but but we were talking earlier that we gender so many things mm-hmm. i'm getting ready to figure out if i have a question i was kind of hoping if i talked long enough like a question would end up coming uh, out. <laughs> well you know it's really interesting i i think <laughs> i think it's interesting the words that you just use when trying to describe it so um because this is the conversation we were having is that to me, paganism means everything that's not a major religion. And, and then we have sure. Wiccan that is an actual religion that is also considered pagan. And I feel like that's confusing to a lot of people because sure. Wiccan is a very white spiritual practice that, that came about like what in the 1800s? It's not even that old. But- no, ni- 1950-some-odd, yes. Yeah. Gerald Gardner's yeah, yeah. invention but, from 1950-some. But even like, uh, I think back, I think in the late 1800s, people were starting to question the church yes. and God, and they were they were starting to practice magic. And, and you know, that's when they were really getting into um, hauntings and, and seances, yeah. and you know, especially in England. And people were starting to, they were still Christian, but they were starting to veer into these other supernatural worlds. But what happened was they created a re- new religion out of it, right? So they they were like, well, we don't want all the... And it was all, mostly women because women were harmed by Christianity. So, and, right. and there's so many studies that you could read about that show a lot of the moments in history where many women felt like, well, this is a place where I could be powerful, which is why in a lot of right. spiritual pagan communities, you see a lot of women, you see a lot of white women, because this is the spirituality that they could turn to when the patriarchy was messing them up over here. It was like, oh, but I have my own magic and, and we still have that today. But when we're talking about paganism, paganism covers every culture. So, you know, literally like Hinduism is technically pagan, you know, Buddhism is technically pagan. Cause it's like, if it's not a major religion, people consider it to be, especially Christianity, people would consider them pagans. In fact, right. when, um, when great Britain, uh, you know, during the famine and, and the whole debacle with great Britain and Ireland, it was very much over Protestant versus Catholic Protestants also sure. called Catholics pagan. They called Catholics pagans because I, ha- I have this in a story I wrote and somebody goes, oh, no, I think you're wrong. No, no, no. They called them pagans. And there was a huge history in our world of Catholicism and Catholics being abused. And there was a lot of violence against Catholicism because they sure. were the closest to um, some of the more indigenous ways. Like they would continue to have altars and practice and they would believe in fairies, but also believe in God. And Protestants were like, oh no, 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 it's us and God. And that's it. Anything else beyond that? And you are a pagan. So when we're looking at pagan ways and the old ways that people like to say, we really have to look at indigenous ways. And, you know, white people are indigenous too. We have to look what was happening before Christianity in these cultures. People were tied to the land. They were tied to the seasons. They were tied to the harvests. Um, You know, there wasn't so much like gender stuff going on. Uh, Everything was kind of like, you know, even gods had like, they were hermaphrodites. They had beards, but boobs. And, you know, there were so many different things. And when we're talking about 
modern day pagans, which unfortunately that's what we run into a lot in the United States, which is why I have issues with hanging out with some of these groups, is they're coming from a Wiccan perspective, a reinvented, yeah. you know, this is the perspective of those women that felt that they wanted to move away from Christianity and start their own religion that centered around, but it still continued to be cis heteronormative. So sure. Yeah. So, so, but it's interesting because you, looping back to what you said was you, you started and you said it was a religion. You go, no, it's a pra- well, spiritual practice, but they're two different things, aren't they? There is they a religion are. and there can, is also can, spiritual practices that are indigenous. Do you, do you know where the word pagan comes from, by the way? Uh, I mean, it, all I know is it means like not religious. Well, so can I give you a quick, a quick yeah, Latin absolutely. lesson? Yeah. Okay. So it comes from the Latin word paganus. And this is yes. when it it's a, originally comes from um, the, the United Kingdom in particular. When, when Rome, when the Romans were in, were in England at the time, especially mm-hmm. as, as Christianity started ramping up after yeah. the, the, like the fourth century, after the third ecumenical council. And they were like, we have a more or less consistent message now, or at least less than, you know, more or less than less whatever that means. So, but you would have a church in like a, a city and, and there would be people out in little villages. The word Paganus translated most literally would be something like rustic. So like people who are out in a village and, and it was hard if you had a priest in a church, like did the, does the priest build a church to serve like 10 people? Or does the pers- priest just like travel an hour by, you know, bullock cart or whatever you do so that he can go and, and uh, you know, and preach to these 10 people? So so pagan comes from this idea that there were people who were not near a church. Mm. And so the, co- the, the cost of converting them, for what it's worth, from the old religions to Christianity was much higher. And so that came to become a, a derogatory term, sort of like we would say somebody is a country bumpkin today. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah, yeah we, you we always somebody... want to point to, right. We always want to make people that aren't Christian uncivilized. That's what his, yes, exactly. Has. And that's exactly what it is. Yeah. And so that was sort of the Not beginning of it. At all, so, people. <laughs> no. So, so when you say that the pagan means not Christian, it's like, well, that's, yeah, that's a more modern interpretation of yeah. it. Cause most people, cause the thing is, is that it was being used derogatorily when Christianity was not the majority of religion yeah. for what it's, it's worth. So it was interesting. Yeah, it was fascinating. I think I got that from the the Margot Adler <laughs> book, the yeah. Drawing Down the Moon book. <laughs> yes. But um, uh, anyway, the point being that, yes, there is a distinction between a religion that should be in some way codified, I guess, and a spiritual practice that is something that is inside you that you create and hopefully we're saying the same thing because that's the way that I see it. Yeah. And we, you know, even to your point of the meaning of the word pagan, a lot of times, and I'll talk about Wiccan uh, here. I'm not trying to insult people who are Wiccan. We're just talking sure. about history. Okay. We're talking about history. These are facts. These are things that happened. Um, no judgments. But even looking at what you just said is that, oh, people that were out in the villages were more difficult. So like, we're going to, we're mm-hmm. going to be derogatory. Well, Wiccan, when it first was developed, they made it very clear. They they took the word magic and they said, well, there's high magic and there's low magic. So they even right. made the divide in that. Well, we are, we are the civilized, you know, coven. We're practicing high magic. It's right. all about ritual. Oh, but all of that, like village healers and the herbalism. Yeah, that's low magic. Nature magic yes. was considered low magic because there was a clear classist approach there. Mm -hmm. And that's why I feel like there's this difference. I mean, that's the case with so many things. Like I won't even get into this. Um, but I also study history as well. And even village healers, uh, you know, it was like what the late 1700s when in Britain, they, they started to, um, say it's illegal for you to practice medicine unless you went to school and you had right. a degree and you became a doctor, which was only available to white rich men. So sure. everyone else right. was a quack, right? So they were like, oh, these village healers are out there doing, you know, they've been doing, this is indigenous magic in, in 
Yes. In every culture, they had indigenous magic, indigenous healing local to the, not just a tribe, but local to sometimes the town, you know, that everybody knew sure. each other and everybody knew one another. And, and they tried to pass that off as uncivilized by saying like, oh, well, because they don't have a degree. Okay. But they're poor. They're, they're not going to try. And, and so villagers legally to get something done, either the, either they had to illegally go to their local healer or they had to travel hundreds of miles to the next city sure, to sure. get, you know, see their doctor. And a lot of these cases, I read like a beautiful research article on this. And a lot of these cases, they would show up and they said, but this guy doesn't know anything about me. My village healer knows everything about me. They grew up with me. They yeah. practice astrology. They know my chart. They know my, they right. know everything. And so that was part of healing is knowing the person intimately enough to be able to facilitate that healing because healing is right. you facilitating their, them healing themselves. Right. That's what it is. You can put drugs into people all day long, but if somebody's not going to be healed unless they heal themselves and you're facilitating it. Whereas these doctors yes. were like, no, but I'm the expert. I'm going to give you something for that. I'm going to heal you. And it's, and we see the divide and that just, mm -hmm. that happens in so many areas of society. This is allopathic medicine now, right? You don't question your doctor. You don't go to your doctor and, your and, the guy says, and you constantly have to question your doctor because they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, I was uh, I was trying yeah. to say that in an ironic sort of yeah, way. It yeah. was <laughs> no, but yeah, people people trust they go and they trust their doctor, not realizing like this person is not a specialist in everything. They know one no, thing really well be. and they guess on everything right. else. And 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 so many people in this world don't know their own bodies. That and we could yeah. talk about that all day long with how that relates to being trans. We are taking hormones we i had to get every test under the sun done to to transition i've i know everything that's going on in my body right now it's in great shape by the way uh everything i know my body so well and i also grew up knowing my body i'm a very physical person maybe that's an aries thing but there are a lot of people that don't even know their they don't know anything they don't pay attention to their body they don't pay attention to the signs that things are wrong right. and they just go to the doctor and they go give me a pill to fix it because i want to do the work it's like, okay, yes, but <laughs> that's not a permanent solution. Yeah. The healing doesn't occur. Agreed. Yeah. I've had several conversations along these yeah. lines in the and, past couple of weeks. And but. these are the same people that are coming to trans people and claiming that we're like mutilating our Something's bodies. It's like with this. Yeah. we out of everyone probably know our body more than you. Yeah. Yes. Well, yes, no doubt. Um, Shoot, we're we're running low on time. I have one more question that I want yes. that I want to ask you because I want to. We could talk about paganism till like tomorrow. I'm gonna have that's on great my podcast. We're gonna have an entire episode on that. Let's do it. Let's do <laughs> it. I but, finally get that out there. <laughs> um, but I want to ask because <clears throat> I want to talk about you. I want to talk about Caden. Yes, what? Yes. What is what is the future? What is what do you what are you going to create? What is gonna what will Caden take this in the triple goddess way? Okay. Cause I'm going to say this, but what, what is the mother that is Caden going to birth? What's going to come into the, from, from the crone's wisdom and the maiden's curiosity, what, what's going to be born out of, out of Caden? Thank you for asking. You know, there's so many projects I'm working on right now, but my baby is my novel series. And, mm. you know, it's interesting because back in 2016, when I went to Glastonbury, I was initiated by the goddess at that point. And then after I went to Glastonbury, I actually went to Ireland for a while. So I, I sure. met the goddess. I felt like I, I downloaded a lot of that energy. And when I came back from that trip in 2016, that's when I was told, you have to leave your show. You have to leave you know, the world of Hollywood behind. I didn't realize until a few years later that I actually had to move out of there. And that's when I started writing what initially was a film, then it became a TV series. And now it's a novel that's called Charlie's Song. It went through a whole bunch of different iterations. And it is a story about a young group of teenagers who are LGBTQ, queer, and trans in the 1800s who deal with a revolution that is that happens and i'm going to spoil it a little bit here but there's a huge storm that happens this is what happened in france during the french revolution a huge storm wipes out all the crops 
and people are left to try to survive. And what happened during the French Revolution, long story short, is there was a shortage of food. And so the upper class and the lower class, you know, and people were starving and dying and people revolted. So the story is very much inspired by that era. And that's my baby. Um, that's something that I'm working on. And when I went to to Ireland and Scotland and Glastonbury, I got that idea downloaded into me. I've been working I on see. it for eight years. In this Beltane, this Beltane in a few days is going to be eight years. And it's a trilogy. And I specifically want to write the book so I can turn around and turn it into an animated series. I don't sure. really want live action as much as I want you know, the animation, I want to be able to have more diversity than you can get from human people. Um, I don't want to pay the big bucks of making it live action. I don't want to go to a big studio that's going to like take it and ruin it. Right. And there's a lot of magic in there that I want to be able to have that I think is going to be a little cheesy if it's yeah. live action. So that is my right. future. That's what I have been pushing for and everything else I'm working on is kind of like a side thing. You know, I'm working with the, um, gender, um, uh, California aggregation of gender diversity, helping them sure. build, build a, a trans art history museum. I do my own content just to help trans people. But this story, I want this story to be a community effort. I want it to get in the hands. I want trans people to be able to see themselves as leading roles in major epic stories. And at the end yeah. of the day, I want to get it made so that hundreds of people get jobs. And I want it to be by a trans or queer owned company. I want, you know, you think about the billions of dollars JK Rowling makes. It's like, I want to give that to the right people. I don't have kids. Sure. I don't have anybody to leave this to. So I, while I'm alive, I want to make something huge that gives back to my community and and creating storytelling in this way and shows and movies that's kind of a huge way to do it so that's my future it is i hope it's everybody amazing. help me buy my book when it's out when it's out when i finally finish it i have adhd so when i finally finish it <laughs> it's on the last oh, well, leg absolutely. it's on the last leg good good can am i able to ask or is it going to be too big of a, a spoiler um what is what's the song what is charlie's song can you explain oh, the title yeah, absolutely so Without, in the okay. book and this is a spiritual thing for me um when i first uh had my spiritual awakening so it's it's kind of got a few meanings when i had my first spiritual awakening i started like i remember sitting under like a huge fairy tree and i got i just felt like this beautiful energy just like coming into my body and i felt mm -hmm. so connected to the earth and in during that meditation, I started hearing this, this hum in my ears. And ever since then, I can hear it now. Ever since then, when only when I am connected to the earth, I hear a hum. I hear a deep hum for the earth. If I'm working with the fairies, I hear a higher pitch hum. And I started hearing these different melodies that were coming from different aspects of, of the earth. Sure. Now, that's part of it. But in Charlie's song is called Charlie's song because Charlie is the main character. It's a trans individual. And that hum to me is when you know you're connected, when you know you're on the right path. I so see. when Charlie yeah. hears this hum, um, that very early on in the book, so I'm not spoiling anything because I think it was like chapter three, one of Charlie's teachers says, you know, that is your soul song. That is your song calling you. That's how you know you're on the path to destiny. Makes me a little Ooh. teary thinking about it. Yeah. Is that you hear the hum, you know, you're in alignment. Like when I meet people such as yourself, then I know that we've meant to be soulmates. We're meant to be connected. I hear that hum. And I know when I'm in a place where I don't hear that, it, it's not the right thing. So, so throughout sure. the story, Charlie is discovering that, you know, they have these gifts, um, storm magic, I'm gonna spoil it for you. And, and their path is to become a healer using this magic. And they all along the way, they figure out like, what, what direction do I go in? And when they're really in the moment, they hear that song and that's their soul song sure. speaking to them. That's their connection to the earth. Oh. That Hopefully I can amazing. get all this across in my book because I can talk about it. Sure enough. <laughs> can I write it? Is this is a is a question? No, I'm trying. I'm trying. I no. I mean, the you, you you pulled it out really quickly. I mean, I because I because I get that. You know, it's not. I don't. It's not an audible thing for me. It's yeah. a. It's a. It's, 
like a, ch- a chill. I yeah. don't know it. And that's it's like how it is in the book. For me. It's, it's like a vibration in your body. Like I yes, can hear yes, it, yes. but it's also a vibration in your body. Okay. So okay. when Charlie's like first time, it's like he, you know, he feels this energy moving in his body and everything feels like, ooh, and okay. then, and then, and then the hum is just part of it. So right. it's that, it's that connection of your, your physical yeah. form and your spirit and everything working in conjunction and alignment that, that is your song. Every, and everyone has a soul song. Everyone came here to do something and whether or not right. we're brave enough to do it is another question. That's the question, but that's, uh, that's why we need the leadership of the trans fairy prince. Yes. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> I'm working on it, people. I'm I'm actually spending, um, I'm out of work at the moment and I've exhausted all possibilities. So I was like, okay, while I wait for something to pop up, I will be trying to finish my book as best as possible over the next few months so that I can have a Kickstarter. I can get my editors in there. I can get that thing be awesome. in your hands. I want to get yeah. that done this year. I cannot wait. I'm serious. I, that's, that's, You're it's welcome to be an we... early reader. <laughs> If you, if you need like an editor, I mean, I've written a couple of things, so, you know, you tell me, but, um, no, I think it would be awesome. So, cause I think the way you describe things and I don't know for, at least for me, like it was, it was, you described it and I went, yeah, I got it. Exactly. I know that exactly. It's, it's, it's but then exactly you try to write I a felt, fiction so. story, right? And th- this is my challenge is I can talk about it all day long, but then you have to incorporate it into a plot. And not and not make it cheesy True. and not have too many people do exposition. So there is a lot of challenges in this story I've encountered of how do I how do I show this magic? Because it's not like I snap my fingers and I'm lighting candles like that's made up. One hundred percent does not happen. I don't care. I don't care what witch you are. You cannot do that. Right. Uh, I'm just gonna say that. But it, it's like how do you show this magic? And and it really is about describing how it feels inside. And that's yeah. why, you know, it's like, how do you show it in a live action? How do you show it on, on camera? Like you don't want to have all these cheesy effects when it really is an no. internal process. So that has yeah. been a big challenge is it, it's, it, it got much, the story got a thousand times better when I turned it into a book, as opposed to imagining how to display this on, on a show. Right. I can't, like even like in an hour and a half too, like imagine you have a 90 minute feature film. I mean, yeah, yeah. How do you even get started? And this so, is a long book. Uh, it is eight hundred and forty thousand words, which is like oh double gosh. double at most books. And so that's why it's taken me so yeah. long. It's a big, and this is only one of three in a trilogy. And I've got another prequel. Oh my about gosh! This. I mean, it's a, it's a whole trilogy, and it's going to be. It's like Lord of the Rings size. You know, it's pretty big. Yeah. So I'm, well, I'm working significantly on it. larger. I think yeah. each of the Lord of the Rings books is like, you know, 70, 80,000. So if yeah. you, I mean, you're like, you're going to be a yeah. double. Yeah. I'm Lord trying to Rings edit it person. down and, and people will be like, Oh, that's too long. It's like, I read Brander Sanderson books. Those are like 400,000 words. Yeah. Okay. It's like taking me 50 hours. I mean, but then, but then it's, right. it's like, Oh, but he's been writing for a while. I don't care. A story is a story. And like people yeah. will initially, people will, he will go, Oh, that's a lot. I'm like, yeah, but you haven't read it yet. How do you know? It's actually a lot. Maybe it's maybe right. it's the right length. It's supposed to be until I get the right. readers in there. I'm never really going to know. Maybe it's a journey that we have to go on and it's just going to take that long. <laughs> and I believe, yeah. Have you read, um, Neil Stevenson? Do you know that guy? No, I haven't. Okay. Every book is like 16,000 pages, maybe a slight give or take, you know, 15,000. But, um, he he's got this one i think it's a trilogy is it four books i don't recall but all told it's it's like five or six thousand pages for one story and i'll tell you about halfway through i'm like well, i'm really not sure this is gonna be worth it and i got to the very end of it and i went okay whew, i'm glad i plowed through that but halfway through it was like this is too long i'm like this is it's too much, but everything Neil Stevenson does, this is my take on him, is that everything like lays seeds for, for yes. something else. That's exactly the, how I write. Yeah. W- which is, which is, yeah. you know, like Vladimir Nabokov, um, you know, I'm trying to think of others, but you know, like this is good literature. This is literature going yeah. from, you know, 
young girl coming of age with a fairy prince. <laughs> you know. Yeah, my my favorite story. Less so one of my favorite books of all time is The Count of Monte Cristo. I love that mm. book. It is fourteen hundred yes. pages. Fourteen hundred yes. pages. I mean, it's like right there. I can see it. Uh, it's sitting under my lamp because I love it so much, and it's huge. And I mean, it takes you on a journey. You have mm-hmm. to go on this journey. It. It, it tells this whole story and it's like, it couldn't be shorter because you have to get dive in. And I feel like maybe mm-hmm. for easier books, my book also has a lot of different plot points. You know, it's, there's, um, you know, there's what's happening internally. There's what's happening in this group of people. There's what's happening with the, you know, this and that there's so many different things that you really just can't, you just can't rush through that, you know? And I felt like I wrote this all and I said, okay, this is going to take me a lot longer to work on. Cause this is like two and a half books. I've written sure. literally, I have like 1.6 million words in Scrivener at this point. <laughs> and that's also notes. I mean, I've taken notes. I have, sure. I have giant notes pages that are 80,000 words. And I was like, okay, that's a whole book, but you, yeah. you know, you, you tell the story that you need to tell in this amount of time. And the way that I've done this is a, again, I want to, it to be a show. So I've divided the first book into eight parts. I mean, you're going to get one book, but it's eight parts and they are episodic. Sure. So this part is themed this. So like a, like a little chunk of story happens and then closes and then the next chunk happens. So you go through this journey, but you can also like, Hey, at any point in time, you can read part one and just put it down for a second and then go back to it. But yeah, but like, you know, and, and let's just let's just end with this. Like, there are just too many rules. There's too many gender rules. There's too many rules what writers should do. There's too many rules what pagans should do. And at the end of the day, you just have to tell your story and be an expression of yourself. And if that's a long ass book, fine. That's what it is. Right. Right. If, that, if this is what I'm going to self publish it, I'm going to pay for it myself, hopefully through a Kickstarter. And this is my offering to the world. And if I want it to be that long, then who cares, right? Why are people telling me it shouldn't be? Because of social expectations. Yeah, it's all crap. And now we need to break all the rules. I agree. Let's do it. I'm telling you. I'm I'm down. (laughs) So am I. (laughs) All right. (laughs) I will. I guess let's go ahead and shut it down. This was a beautiful ending. Um, I don't know how much I have to express to you, like, you know, your impact and how much I care about you, Aww. presumably. I, Because if I express too much, I'll end up crying and maybe you'll end up crying. I think and, we and, should you know. cry. And everybody know, everybody here needs to know that we met because we referred to uh, one another. And we literally got on a call for a quick chat and it was three hours or more. <laughs> like we just, yeah. we just immediately were like, oh, we're friends. <laughs> We're best, we're yeah. besties, which I, and I appreciate you so much. I love when I meet people Thank out you. of the blue and it's like, oh, I need to know this. Uh, we get along <laughs> so well, so many different it's, points. Yeah. Yeah. It's really super clear. So, cause I know, yeah, never mind. Goodness, shut it down. We're not going to Cause we'll go on another today. 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll say, we'll have a whole other episode for crying. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. But I do just want to express, you know, my gratitude. Thank you so much for coming on, for talking with me, just for everything that you've done in your life and the every, everything you've done for me. I appreciate it all. So, so wonderful. Thank so. you. Thanks for having me and letting me chat your ear off about my stuff. I, of course. I, I, you know, a lot of people ask me about my transition, but people don't often ask me about my other parts of my life and I'm trying to figure out how to bring them out in social media because for me, I'm more of a responding responded person. Like if you ask me a question, I talk about, I don't want to just get on and be like, let me make, let me start this conversation, but nobody asked, nobody asked about my book, but let me talk (laughs) about it. So it's nice to have these, these conversations where, Oh, you get to learn about my spirituality, about me being pagan, about my story and, and what I'm working on. That's really important to me. Well, see, I liked, so we talk about identity and identity, a gender transition is not an identity transition. So I care about your identity. Yeah. I want to hear who makes you, what yes. makes you. Thank you. So, You're so right. So that's, um, yeah, I think we, I think it's too, too often we want to like segment, you know, a story into, you know, well, this is that one tiny thing I did like some Thursday in 1984 and you go, hmm. <laughs> What I mean, did I do in 1984? Hour? 
Actually, 19, I, I was on a panel one sure. called 1984 because it was a pop pop culture panel and it was a lot of really good movies came out that year, which is just a random thing. <laughs> so I know what you were doing in 1984. We were watching those movies. Like a lot right. of really good movies came out. I, I'm spacing on all of them, but there's a lot. Go look it up. How, how about 1984 with the Eurythmics soundtrack in it? Do you remember Ooh. that? Yes, yes. And I'm trying to think what else came out that year around Ugh. that. But yeah, it was There's a lot of so many with some amazing soundtracks, too. That's what yeah. I'm recalling. A lot of movies, a lot of so, soundtracks. Uh, what was, mm -hmm. um, oh my God, why am I spacing on the name of that? That Harrison Ford movie. What is it called? No, I think that. Oh, Blade out. Runner? Yes, thank you. Oh my gosh. I don't, I don't Runner know if then? that was 84. There was some something like it's Blade close. Runner esque that came out, but I'm, I got to look that up. Mm. I think like one of the aliens came out. Like there's just so much that came out oh. during that time. So I also, good. I also think actually like, Die Hard might have come out that yeah, year too. Yeah, I think like which... Revenge of the Nerds. Like there was uh, that Revenge of the Nerds. Oh my god, <laughs> that was my favorite movie. <laughs> really? I and so much so that I had an award show, and I invited those two gents, um, and they presented the main characters. No kidding. Because, um, yeah, Robert Carradine and oh my gosh, mm, Booger Presley. I'm why am I spacing on their yeah, name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I I invited them to present on the show because I I'll have to send you that video. I I love them so much. Yes. I just grew up and I was like, That's awesome. Booger was me. I was like, I'm this guy. He does not care about anything. He just walked around in his underwear. <laughs> He's so That's weird. funny. Yeah. He was also in um, Risky Business. Right. Yeah. Well, but he, there he played the straight, basically the straight guy to yeah, Tom Cruise's, was, you know, wacky. Dude. He was also in one of my other favorite movies, Better Off Dead. Okay. If you have not mm. seen that movie, it still holds up. I love that movie. So, 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 so much. Good. And John Cusack. Oh, right. He was my crush. He is amazing. That movie. Yeah. The, uh, Hey, I want my $2. Yeah. Sorry. Kid. Yeah, Don't have a yeah. dime. Oh my God. Didn't ask for a dime. I yeah. asked for $2. <laughs> I, I still do the $2 like all the time. No. And I was a skier. So that movie was really big for me. Oh, and my, right. we my sisters and I would chase each other down the hill yelling that I want my $2. I was like, what are you doing? Is that's the one with the friend is the French girl in that one? Oh the yeah, French that was the friend and the and the mom cooking puts, the French. He puts his testicles French on me. Fries <laughs> and frosh dressing. Yeah. That, was, that woman. Oh, that movie is so fun. I can go back and watch that. I did watch it recently and it's it still holds up. Unlike some movies I, I will, love, which kind of don't, but that one does. I'm gonna have to go back because because it was so amazing. So all right, before we go into now film criticism, how about if I shut it down? I will say, I am Amethyst Herrick. I've been speaking with Kate Nedopak. Hopefully I got it better there this time. I think I screwed it at the beginning, too. I can't even... <laughs> Nedopak. What's wrong with me? <clears throat> there you go. Thank you for, for doing <laughs> it right. nice Ukrainian. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, see, this is... I'm Irish and like German, so yeah. we, we, have, <laughs> I don't really, we don't give a crap. I don't know. Um, but we've been talking about. See, you gave me the you gave me the ending of this. We have been talking on Gender Identity Weekly about breaking all the rules. Thank you. Bye.